We often talk about crime cases on here in which there is a clear divide of people who think that the crime was accidental or that the crime was intentional, sometimes even adding in the whole other layer of the crime being premeditated. Today's case is one of those cases. It's one where there is a lot of division out there, people thinking that this was an accident, while others are saying this was clear, calculated murder. Now, because this case involves a mixture of family members, I believe that is why there is also such a divide out there, because people are trying to wrap their minds around how a family member could do this to another family member. Even more, how a parent could do this to a child. So we are gonna talk all about this case now, and I'm gonna break it down for you, and you can decide for yourself what you think. Before we jump into the case, guys, please take a quick second, hit that subscribe button below. It is totally and absolutely free. Like this video, do all of the things. My name is Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Let's jump right on. I found my new favorite game to play and it's called Heyday. Heyday is free to download on the App Store and Google Play. Now Heyday is a fun and very interesting game that I like to play to just unwind and escape from everyday life. It has challenges and a lot of questions for all of my true crimers out there too. Like why do they sell dynamite on a farm? And what is Greg doing all alone in the farmhouse? What does he have to hide? You can create mystery about the characters, plus you can build a beautiful country getaway and design it just the way you like. Now I love the little garden that I built and the cute little pond and the seating area. I mean, the graphics and the customization it is so fun it really helps me turn my mind off i love it plus the entire game is relaxing with the music that's playing it has these beautiful visuals plus these cute tiny little animals which i love it is the best download heyday now using my link in the description or the qr code on screen there is always something happening in the game and now you can also play an oktoberfest themed event for a very limited period of time which let me just tell you you, it is so fun. So go download it now. Link is in the description. You can also use my QR code and I will see you over on Heyday. 53-year-old Rita Marie Frazier was born on June 12, 1979 to her parents Elaine and Haskell Frazier Jr. She grew up with three siblings, Haskell III, Donald, and Kathy. They grew up in Walterboro, which is located in Colleton County, South Carolina. Rita attended Walterboro High School before going on to earn a bachelor's degree from the University of South Carolina, and then her master's degree from Charleston Southern University in early childhood education. During college, she started dating a man named Walter Pangalangan. Walter, who goes by Wally, is a physical therapist, and the two of them had their first child together named Ashley in 1989. Three years later, they had their second child and named her Elizabeth and this was in 1992. Walter and Rita ended up getting married, and after college, Rita got a job with the Colton County School District in 1994. She worked several teaching jobs, ranging from elementary, middle, and high school. It would be 14 years until Rita and Wally had their third and final child together. This was on March 28, 2006, and they named her Christina. Now, Christina was born with several complications, including cerebral palsy, spastic quadriplegia, developmental delays, and a seizure disorder. Cerebral palsy is caused by abnormal brain development, often before birth, and it affects a person's ability to move and maintain balance and posture. Spastic quadriplegia is a specific form of cerebral palsy that affects both arms and legs and often the torso and face as well. Quadriplegia is the most severe of the three types of spastic cerebral palsy, and it requires lifelong treatment and support. Due to Christina's disabilities, she was unable to walk, talk, or do things that required fine motor skills, like feeding herself. 
She also had dysphagia, which causes difficulty swallowing and is a common complication of cerebral palsy. Due to this, Christina could only eat very small amounts of solid food, and she got the majority of her nutrition from meal replacement shakes, like Ensure. Even though she was nonverbal, Christina was full of personality, and she could easily convey all of her emotions. She was typically very happy, always smiling, and loved attention. She was able to crawl and loved to swim, and her absolute favorite show to watch was Dora the Explorer. Christina's innocent soul and unconditional love brought so much happiness to her family, to her friends, teachers, and anyone who came into her life. She loved to go to Disney World, blow bubbles, and her absolute favorite food to eat hands down whenever she could was chocolate donuts. Unfortunately, though, over the years, Wally began using various substances and drinking alcohol, which started causing problems in he and Rita's marriage. As most of us know, even with a master's degree, teachers are seriously underpaid, and taking care of Christina on her own felt like a daunting task. And as a physical therapist, Wally was bringing in most of the family's income. But Rita now had to make the difficult decision to do what was best for her family and to separate, all due to Wally not getting his substance use under control. Rita's daughter, Elizabeth, later said that once her dad left, so did the money. At one point, Wally left to live in the Philippines for a period of time, and he wasn't paying any child support. Thankfully, teachers do have decent health insurance, so most of Christina's medical needs were taken care of, but it was still hard for Rita to care for her on her own, especially when Ashley and Elizabeth got older and moved out. Ashley went on to have her own children, and Elizabeth went to college, got married, and began working as a minister with her husband, who was also a pastor. They would come and help with Christina when they could, but Rita began relying heavily on babysitters if she ever needed to do anything alone. This was especially true during the summers when school was out, because Rita would clean houses to earn extra money. Even though working as a full-time teacher, a mom, and caregiver was hard for Rita, she still managed to be awarded with the honor of Teacher of the Year twice. Every school's Teacher of the Year is chosen by being nominated by fellow school faculty and is typically due to being a leader to other teachers, having excellent relationships and results with students, and just being an exemplary educator. It's an honor for many teachers to get recognized for their hard work and to have validation from their colleagues who notice and appreciate their efforts to go above and beyond for their school. So the fact that Rita received this honor two times shows that at one point, she really was a great teacher. However, after her second nomination in 2014, it seemed like something changed within the next couple of years in Rita's life. Now, I'm not exactly sure when they met, but at some point after this, Rita met and began dating a man named Larry King Jr. Yeah, and no, no affiliation to the talk show host Larry King. Now, the first time I could find them mentioning each other on social media was back in 2015, and they appeared to be a pretty new couple at that point. 46-year-old Larry Eugene King Jr. was born and raised in Walterboro, South Carolina in 1978. He attended Walterboro High School and got married to his longtime girlfriend named Dee. Larry and Dee had two sons together, one named Chase in 1999 and another named Cole in 2001. But unfortunately, they ended up getting a divorce just a few years later. Larry was always a hard worker and spent several years working for a machine manufacturing company called Bid Group Technologies and then for an industrial contracting company called Renfro Brothers. Even though he and Dee were divorced, they made maintained a good co-parenting relationship and a friendship for their sons. However, Larry liked to party and was also involved in the biker bar scene, and Larry began using substances and excessively drinking. He became addicted to meth and eventually had to use it just to be able to function while at work. Now, aside from this, Larry was always involved in his children's lives and helped support them financially. But it wasn't until 2014, when his sons moved in with him full-time, that he got clean from meth. It was somewhere during this time frame that Larry began dating Rita. At the time, Rita really liked that Larry was clean because drugs had been a huge issue in her previous marriage, and she really didn't want to deal with that again and go down that path. Larry's sons lived with him until they were old enough to move out on their own. And after that, with less responsibilities at home, he unfortunately started partying more heavily again. 
Even though they were dating for several years, Larry and Rita always maintained separate households. Larry was really great with Christina, and he would help Rita with her as much as he could. He loved Christina, but he also loved his freedom. And now he was an empty nester with adult children and didn't really want to be tied down again. So this, along with sporadic meth binges, caused Rita and Larry to be off and on, and living together full-time really wouldn't have really been the best idea since they were constantly breaking up and getting back together. It was too inconsistent, and Rita had to maintain some sense of stability for Christina. However, during this time, some people say they started noticing a change in Rita, and she began wanting to join Larry at the local bars more and more. They liked to ride his motorcycle to places like Myrtle Beach, and it was always difficult for Rita to find someone to care for Christina during these times, especially overnight. Christina wasn't necessarily difficult to manage, she just really craved attention, and she relied on others to get her in her wheelchair, wheel her around, change her, help her eat, and basically do everything. It's not like she was rambunctious, it was just a lot for anyone who didn't have experience being a caretaker. Plus, Christina had to be physically lifted onto her chair, onto the couch, her bed, into the car, really anywhere, which would make it difficult for some people who may not be very strong. As she got older, it became harder for Rita as well, and she actually developed several back injuries from constantly lifting Christina. Not to mention, in all of this, hiring someone with experience in the specialized care that she needed was definitely more expensive than your typical babysitter. People who know Rita have said that she was growing increasingly frustrated with people being unwilling to help her, and it seemed like she wasn't able to live the carefree life that she wanted to with Larry. Her other children were adults, but Christina was only in middle school, and she would never be able to live on her own anyway. So around 2018, Rita left teaching for the school system and began teaching early childhood education classes for future teachers. It hasn't been explicitly said, but I think that this is probably because you can retire after teaching for 25 years in South Carolina. So maybe Rita was collecting her teacher retirement and then working as a professor part-time. She also decided to begin renting out some of the empty rooms in her home as well for extra money. She had one consistent roommate that lived in the back of the house, and in the summer of 2019, she met a woman at a local bar that would move in as well. In May of 2019, Brittany Honeycutt was between leases and just needed a place for her and her two small children to stay for a couple of months. So Rita told her that she had to evict the previous roommates because they brought bed bugs into the house. They put holes in the wall and were just really disrespectful, which personally, it's kind of weird to tell someone that you want to move in with you all of that and say all of that. But Rita said that she had an exterminator treat the home for bed bugs and that everything was fine now. So Brittany thought that Rita seemed really nice and figured that since she was a teacher, she was also probably a good person and someone safe for her and the kids to live with for a little while. When she first moved in, Brittany said that everything seemed great. Her toddler liked to play on the floor with Christina, and Christina would hand him his toys and laugh, and they would watch cartoons. And Brittany worked a lot, and when school let out for the summer, her kids would spend a lot of time with family members while she was at work. However, over the next month, Brittany said that the house started to become messier and messier, even though her children were hardly spending any time there. She said that she noticed a strong smell of urine coming from Christina's room as well, but she thought that maybe it was from diapers being left in a trash can. She also said that on several occasions, Rita would put Christina in the living room and then go back to her bedroom to talk on the phone with the door closed. Christina would crawl her way back to her mom's room and start trying to get in, but she wasn't able to turn the door handle. Brittany said that she would scream and cry, but Rita would ignore her until Brittany had to knock on the door herself and tell her that Christina needed her. She said that Rita would often just yell back and holler, I'm on the phone. So then Brittany would take Christina back to the living room, find her a show to watch, and give her some juice to keep her occupied until Rita finally came back out. Now, Brittany said that things started to get uncomfortable in the house when Rita began asking her to babysit Christina when the other sitter wasn't able to come or if she didn't have money to pay the sitter. So like I mentioned though, Brittany worked full time and had two small kids of her own that she had to entertain for the summer. And it was often just not feasible for her to be able to babysit. She said that Rita always seemed really upset that no one would help her with Christina and even recalled the babysitter saying she would if she got paid. 
There was one occasion where Rita asked Brittany if she would just watch Christina overnight so that she could go out. And Brittany said that she would, but that she had to go to work the next day and would only be able to make sure that she was okay throughout the night. Rita got frustrated and asked if Christina could maybe go with Brittany's sons to their grandmother's house. But Brittany said no, because having two little boys was already overwhelming enough, and their grandmother wouldn't be able to lift Christina. Brittany then alleges that Rita said, and I quote, Well, if you just take her to work with you, you can leave her in the car with the windows down. I do it all the time. Okay, so Brittany was obviously completely shocked that Rita would even suggest that, and she flat out said no. So Rita said, okay, she'd be home in the morning. But the next day, Brittany woke up to Christina trying to get out of her bedroom, and Rita had in fact not come home. There was also a time where the babysitter was over and told Rita that someone had knocked on the door asking to talk to her when she wasn't home. She told the babysitter and Brittany not to ever open the door for anyone, and Brittany later found out that it was CPS trying to conduct welfare checks on Christina. So what would make CPS want to conduct checks on Christina, the daughter of an accomplished teacher? Well, apparently teachers at Christina's school had noticed untreated injuries on her, and there had actually been four calls made to CPS in the span of three years. One of the most concerning reports happened after Christina came to school with extremely bad burn blisters on her body, which hadn't been tended to or treated by a doctor. The school told Rita that she needed to get Christina seen by a doctor immediately, and she said she would. The next day, Christina came back to school with the same wounds, still untreated. And at that point, they were actually oozing, which I know is really awful, but just think about how horrible that was for Christina. So the school ended up calling CPS for Rita not taking Christina to the doctor. But all this did, though, was make Rita extremely upset. She actually said to the teachers, next time Christina is hurt, I just won't send her to school if you're going to call CPS. Which is seriously disturbing for her to say, considering she, of all people, should know that teachers are mandated reporters. Brittany ended up only living with Rita for about three months, and she said that during that time, she never actually saw Larry. But she heard Rita talk about him a lot. She said that Rita told her that they had been broken up, but recently got back together because Larry just couldn't resist her. By the end of July of 2019, Brittany and Rita weren't getting along well at all. Rita had even asked Brittany if she would quit her job and she could live at the house for free if she would just watch Christina full time. But Brittany told her that wasn't financially feasible for her because she needed to save up money for her and her son's new place. Rita just never seemed to accept no for an answer. And it was really weird that she was literally trying anything to pawn her daughter off on someone else. Like, bars are fun and everything, don't get me wrong. But what is so important that you need to be gone all the time? It was like Christina was getting in the way of the life that Rita wanted to live. So Brittany and her boys ended up moving out on August 1st. And with Christina's main babysitter only coming every now and then, Rita needed to find someone else to look after her daughter so that she could go out and party. Rita would sometimes have to bring Christina with her when she taught the child development classes. And one student named Lindsay Lewis had an interest in children and possibly becoming a nurse. So Rita convinced her that babysitting Christina would be a good learning experience for her. Lindsay agreed, and only one day after Brittany moved out on Friday, August 2nd, Lindsay came over to Rita's house just to go over Christina's routine and learn how to do everything for when she would eventually babysit in the future. However, after showing Lindsay how to change her diaper, what her normal schedule is like, how to move her, and all of the things that she needed to know, Rita asked that since she was already there, if Lindsay would mind watching Christina while she and Larry went out on a date. Lindsay told her that she would, and after Rita left, Lindsay spent some time with Christina. She gave her one of her insure shakes, and then she put her to bed. She expected Rita to be back after just a few hours, but by 9.30, she got a text message from Rita saying, checking on Christina. And then Lindsay was more shocked when she said she wouldn't be back until the morning. Lindsay hadn't agreed to spend the night, and there was actually no food in the refrigerator or the pantry besides a couple of those Ensure shakes. Rita hadn't even told Lindsay if she was supposed to give Christina any solid food or not, which could have been really dangerous with her swallowing issues. Plus, she didn't know how to load Christina in the car to go get herself food either. 
She decided to just make the best of it, and Rita told her that she would be home tomorrow to go to the grocery store for food. However, the next day came, and Rita didn't come home. Lindsay actually didn't hear from her until Sunday, and that was when she got a message saying that Larry had food poisoning and she had been taking care of him. Rita didn't get back home until after 5 p.m. on Sunday. And even though Lindsay was confused and upset, she didn't make a huge deal out of it and just decided to go home after Rita got back. Later that night, Rita loaded up Christina and they headed over to Larry's house. The two of them spent the night there, but the next morning, Rita and Larry could be seen on his security cameras arguing on the front porch. A short time later, at around 11 a.m., Larry exited the house holding Christina and angrily opening the back seat of Rita's Volkswagen Jetta and putting Christina inside. Nearly six hours later, police were dispatched to Larry's home, and the first responding officers came upon a scene more tragic than anything they had ever seen before. When the first officer pulled into the driveway of Larry's house, she said she saw a pair of legs sticking out from the tall grass near a vehicle. When she approached, she saw a little girl laying face down in the grass with burns and blisters all over her body. When paramedics arrived minutes later, they realized that 13-year-old Christina was already deceased and beyond help at that point. They attempted to take her temperature, which reached 110 degrees, but that was only because that is as far as the thermometer could read. Larry was outside, but Rita had actually gone back inside, and upon questioning them, Rita said that she had only left Christina in the car for a few minutes while she went inside to get cigarettes, and that the car and the AC were on. However, the cameras on Larry's property painted a much more sinister picture of what really happened. And in actuality, Christina baked inside a 130-degree car for nearly six hours. We all hear about tragedies of hot car deaths all the time in the media. About 40 children die each year from heat stroke in vehicles. It's every parent's worst nightmare, and every parent assumes it could never happen to them until it does. It can happen to parents from all walks of life, mothers, fathers, rich people, poor people, all races, literally anyone. Oftentimes, it's a result of tired or stressed parents with a million other things on their mind. Maybe there was a change in their morning routine, but their brain went on autopilot and the parent genuinely thought they took their child to daycare or tucked them into bed. They don't even think about it until they are suddenly reminded or come across their child in the back seat after it's too late. It's a horrible and tragic mistake, inexcusable, but a mistake nonetheless. This, however, is not that kind of case. And thank God for security cameras, because if it weren't for those, two people may have gotten away with murder. Larry and Rita both ended up being charged with murder, criminal conspiracy, and great bodily harm of a child for Christina's death. After they were arrested and brought to the station, both Larry and Rita swore up and down that the car was on when they placed Christina inside, but not even their own defense attorneys believed them. That's what you're going for, okay? And that involves admitting to some hard things that the jury knows anyway. There's no point in saying that air conditioner was for sure on because it wasn't. There wasn't. There's not any way possible it could have been. It was on when I cut it on. What happened to Stop it. it. Stop it. It doesn't matter whether it was whether it was on. You believed it was. Okay? For you to fight the issue, how are you going to prove that it was on? It was clearly off when the police got there. Clearly it was off. It was. She baked. Her, 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 the, the thermometer couldn't go any higher than it did when Richard Harvey, the coroner, took her temperature. It was as high as the thermometer would go. That air conditioning, for however long, was not on. It was not. Okay? That's the truth. Otherwise, you couldn't have had that result. And I know that you hate that, but that's the truth. You cannot deny that because the jury is going to know it anyway. Okay? To say, to argue, no, it was on. That, to argue, I thought it was on. I really did. I thought I turned it on. That's good enough. Okay? It has to be. Otherwise, the jury's got two choices. Clearly it wasn't on. So you're lying if you say it was on. 
unless you can prove it, which you can't. It's not possible to prove because it clearly was not on. Clearly, you wouldn't have that result. It's not possible. Did anybody even check the car to see if it might have malfunctioned? Because I cut that. You air are fighting on. for your life. Uh, no, yeah, you I don't am. Seem and to. You don't believe me. Uh, no, I don't. I tell you, I cut the air conditioner off. I don't. I don't believe you. I don't. And more importantly, it doesn't matter what I believe. It matters what the jury is going to believe. The jury is not going to believe that because that what happened to her would not have happened if it had been on. Okay. It doesn't matter. You you screwed up. You made a mistake, but you did not intend this to happen. Is that tr is it correct that you did not intend it to happen? Yes. Yeah. All right. Then let's find the best way to keep you out of prison for a long time. Okay. The best case scenario is involuntary. That's the best case, and that's five years. That's the best case. So let's try for that. Because if you swing for the fence on this for a not guilty, it's not going to happen. Like so many other cases we hear about lately since this all happened toward the end of 2019, the South Carolina court system was backed up for years, and the lead investigator on this case actually ended up passing away from COVID, which delayed their trial even further. Larry ended up being granted a $50,000 bond and Rita $100,000, which they ended up posting, and they were able to just live life like normal until their trials began again in August of this year. Now, to be quite honest, I know you only need 10% of the amount to get yourself out. But if there was no food, if Rita couldn't even afford a babysitter, I'm really curious how she could have afforded $10,000 of posting that amount to get herself out of jail if she couldn't even pay a babysitter. It just makes me very curious. Was it that she didn't have the money or was it that she chose to not spend the money on her daughter, Christina? She preferred to spend her money on herself on her boyfriend, on her partying habits, and she didn't want to spend the money on getting a babysitter, getting the proper nutrition for the house, anything like that. Because how do you then just come up with 10 grand like that? Now, when the trial finally began in August of this year, so much disturbing evidence came out that made people realize that this was not like any other hot car death case that had been heard before. Many people even believed that Christina's death was premeditated. However, for some reason, both Larry and Rita decided to plead not guilty instead of taking the safer route of making a deal. When reviewing the security camera footage, at around 11 a.m., Rita and Larry could be seen arguing, and Larry would later say that it was because he confronted her about a possible infidelity, which according to him, she actually ended up admitting to. Larry said that over the course of the entire weekend, he and Rita partied together, did meth together, and by Monday morning, he was exhausted from not sleeping. He didn't feel like arguing anymore, so he asked her to leave and said that they could talk later. He brought Christina out to the car, and many people say that it looks like he basically threw Christina in rather than gently placing her in. There was no point where Rita or Larry could be seen turning on the car, but Larry was adamant that when he put Christina inside, it was already running. Rita did have a push-to-start vehicle, and you could turn it on from the key fob, but typically when you do that, you can see the lights flashing. There was no flashing up until that point, so it's very unlikely that the car was actually on. That day in South Carolina in August, it reached almost 90 degrees outside and the internal temperature of the car would have reached at least 130 degrees, sitting in the blaring sun with no shade. Rita and Larry could be seen arguing some more, and they ended up going back inside. They couldn't be seen coming back out of the house until around 1.45 p.m., but Rita didn't open the door or check to make sure that Christina was okay. Her windows were also extremely tinted, and you couldn't just see right in unless you had your face up against the glass. Both her and Larry just stood on the front porch and continued talking for around 15 minutes, and then they began hugging and kissing. In the doorway, they started getting pretty hot and heavy before going back inside. Larry later said that when they got back in, they did proceed to have sex, while Christina was just in the car alone. They didn't come back outside for over an hour until around 3 p.m., and the only reason Rita approached the car was because she needed to get her cigarettes. 
She tried all of the door handles and realized that the doors were locked. Now, I believe they said the model of the Jetta was about a 2012 year, but I do know that newer cars with push to starts won't lock if the keys are inside. So that could be another way to potentially prove that the car was not actually on, in addition to all of the other evidence, which we're going to get into. After that, Larry and Rita tried to carefully get the windows to open using the old coat hanger method and basically anything other than breaking a window, which is what most parents would do if their child was locked in a car. So when that didn't work, they went and had a nice little swing on the porch for 15 more minutes. At one point, they even started shaking the car a little bit, maybe trying to wake Christina up or to confirm that she wasn't moving. After that, they decided to get in Larry's truck and drive to Rita's house to locate an extra key. Instead of one of them staying behind to at least be there with Christina, apparently it was important for both of them to go, I guess. And once again, they were gone for more than an hour. They didn't get back to the house with that extra key until around 4.30 p.m. But apparently to them, there was no need to rush still or anything like that. So they just sat in the truck and they chatted for a little bit before leisurely strolling over to the car where Christina had been trapped alone for hours. Of course, in the 10 feet from the truck to the car, they had to make a little pit stop first and just hug each other before Larry then tried to use the extra key fob to open the door. However, both of these idiots were so high that neither one of them realized that he was actually pushing the lock button over and over. You can even see the lights blinking like they do when you lock your car. An investigator that testified during the trial said he conducted several tests and said that the lights will not flash like that when you push the lock button if the car is running. Another piece of evidence proving it was not. Finally, at around 4.50 p.m., these complete and utter morons realized that they could use the actual key instead of just the key fob to open the door. But at that point, Christina was already gone. And instead of, I don't know, holding her or trying to do anything they could to revive her, Rita just went inside and Larry put Christina face down in the grass. He could have taken her up to the porch or even inside the freaking house, which this just shows to me how little regard both of them had for this little girl. Even if, 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 if the car was on, you don't just leave a child alone for six hours especially a child with special needs who cannot walk, who cannot get out of the car, who cannot call for help or anything. The first responders found that Christina was also completely soiled, which is to be expected after that long. During the autopsy, the medical examiner found vomit in Christina's lungs, which means she started to inhale stomach fluid as her body was shutting down. Just thinking about the blisters and everything that she went through is completely horrific, but they also determined that she was malnourished as well and had pre-existing infections due to poor hygiene. So there are several different scenarios that could have taken place in this situation. Either Rita and Larry's argument just consumed their minds so much that they completely forgot about Christina, but that is completely unlikely in my opinion. They were standing right there, Especially if the car was on, they would have known that she was in there. Another possibility is that they were both so high on meth that it caused them to forget that she was in the car, or caused them to simply not care. Now, in my opinion, I think not caring is more likely, but Rita tried to insist that she wasn't actually doing meth. So, it isn't necessarily throwing Larry under the bus to say he was on meth, okay? And you were dealing with somebody that's on meth. Now, he might get up there and say you were. I don't know. But like I said, Margie has probably gone out there, sat down with him, sat down with law enforcement, and they picked his brains for everything. Okay? So you can assume if there's something bad out there, Larry's probably going to say it. Mm-hmm. Okay? And he's gotten some sort of a deal, which I don't know what it is. They hadn't told me. Okay? If he, if he testifies, then and they have made a deal with him, they were obligated to tell me what the deal is. But I care, I would prefer if you hadn't been using meth, but it's not fatal, okay? Well, you don't have my drug test? 
I don't care about your drug test. I care about whether you're using it. I don't care whether you tested positive or not. I don't mm -hmm. care. I care. I do care about, because that's not a fight. That's not a critical fight, okay? That's not, that is a fight that you'd rather, it would be better if that didn't come up. But if it did, you know, the more battles that you have to fight, the less likely you are to win, okay? Mm -hmm. You pick a battle and say, this is where we're doing. I got the high ground. This is defensible. This is the position I'm taking. That's where we're fighting. If you let them pick the battle or battles, you're going to get creamed. Okay? So I would prefer if you had not used meth, and I, but I don't know. It matters a lot less to me than that y'all, it's enough that Larry was. Okay? If both of you were, the jury's not going to like it, but it's not the same thing as intent, and it would explain. You've heard people say, well, you know, I was drinking. And for the people that drink, they say, yeah, you were drinking. That's fine. We can kind of uh, we can kind of roll with that. That's just that th that day, you know. Mm -hmm. And perhaps there are people who think the same on meth. I'd rather not go there if I don't have to. But I don't want to fight a battle if he's going to testify. If he testifies that you were using meth, you know, the best thing to do with that is move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the best thing is to ask, and it, as long as it's true, uh, Larry, she loved her daughter, didn't she? Yes. You know, you, you, she tried, she was fixing up her room and everything at her house. Isn't that right? That's right. Okay. And and so the... I just spent $20,000 on her bathroom. Okay. Hiding the cab accessible bathroom. Okay. Just that, bought her a new wheelchair. Okay. For those, school. Those are, those are important things. And those are things I want you to tell the jury about. But it is... That is one of those, of course I love her. I was doing those things. I, I was I was preparing for her future. I expected her to be around a long time. And yes, it got frustrating sometimes. And sure, I, I did leave her out in the car. And I'm sorry if I had any idea this was going to happen. I had, Yes, I'd done it before. I had. And nothing like this ever happened. And you know, if, if Larry and I hadn't been fighting and engaged so much <laughs> with each other, then maybe I would have paid better of attention. And I wish we hadn't been, but we were. But I had no no thought that this was going to happen to my girl okay that's where that's where you want to go okay that's where you want to go the intent okay so you know just um in terms of what you're doing i want you to uh, not to justify but like i said we are you, you have to admit to things that are hard to admit to you have to so that the jury can say, okay, I hate that she did this, but maybe, you know, she's human and she made some mistakes, but she did not intend this. They never mentioned a drug test confirming whether or not she was on meth, but she told her first defense attorney that she didn't do it willingly. Her oldest daughter has even said in an interview that Larry actually drugged Rita by putting meth in her drink. I stand firm behind my mom that she didn't voluntarily get high. Um, she hated drugs. She went to Al-Anon meetings um, because she suffered um, for having addicts in the family. Um, and from Larry being an addict, you know, she went to Al-Anon meetings while he went to NA meetings. And I, they just got back together. So if you notice, he never said on the stand that they were using together. And he also admitted that she slept. So to say that my mom voluntarily used drugs, you know, it, she also said it was the first time it had ever happened or she'd ever been high, which could explain a lot of what everyone saw that day in the video, why she was shaking her head when the judge was saying they were on the drug binge. Well, let me ask you this, uh, Ashley. You just mentioned a number of things, and some, one very important thing. You said that her lawyer advised her not to take the stand, but. Do you think that your mom should have taken the stand to tell her side of the story? And what was the most important point that only she could make? I just, I think that if she, we all thought that if she got on the stand and said that she didn't use those drugs, we just didn't think anyone would have believed her. Even though people that knew my mom knows that she's been sober her whole life you don't think your mom uh, actually partook in the drugs that something was put in her drink. Are you suggesting that Larry King um, 
uh, did something to maybe sexually assault your mother or give her drugs? Uh, is there more to the story that has not been told? And can you well, tell us? I have at least four people um, since the guilty verdict was given Friday told me that um, he had been bragged about it at Faith Home where I guess a rehab facility that he went to that he put a gram and a half of drugs in her drink and I don't think these people would come forward but um if they would if or if they would have before the verdict I, I it might have done something it, it could have helped her now considering that meth supposedly makes you paranoid I doubt someone who has their child with them 99% of the time would just completely forget about them in that moment. Now, I've never done myth, so I can't speak to that. But Christina was always with Rita. So her not being right there with her should have felt out of the norm and should have stood out, unless she just locked her in a room or in the car whenever she didn't want to deal with her on a regular basis, and this was a regular thing for her. Also, if someone drugged you with meth, you'd probably be aware that something was off. And I don't think that Rita would be hugging all over Larry if she thought or knew that she was drugged against her will. Basically, Larry and Rita's defense was that they did know that she was in the car, but they really thought that the car was running. And I just don't see how admitting to leaving your child alone for six hours is a better defense, but I guess to them it showed that there was actually no real intent to kill her. However, one other detail that the prosecution pointed out starts to cast even more doubt on that theory. Sitting right next to Christina on the back seat was a bag, and right on top of the bag was a loaded gun. Describe what that is, please. That is a 9mm handgun that had two different barrels on it. And that was in the top of that bag? It was. The hand on the left, is that one of your team members or your team? That's my photographer spreading the bag so you can see the handgun. And then let me show you state's exhibit number 11. Tell us what that is. That's showing that there are two cartridges in each, or a cartridge in each chamber of the handgun. Okay. When you say cartridge, what do you mean? It's the unfired bullet. So the bullet... It's, a load, it's loaded. It's loaded, okay. yes. And then finally, let me show you state's exhibit uh, 12. What's that? That was a... Tupperware full of cigarettes in the bag. Okay. And that's all in the back seat of the car? Correct. Even if Christina had a hard time with her fine motor skills, what psychotic parent would leave a loaded gun right next to their child at all, let alone for six hours? This has caused some people to believe that Rita really wanted her daughter dead by any means necessary. And any way it ended up happening, she would try to make it look accidental. However, Rita and her daughters refuted that she wanted Christina gone. They stated that Rita had just spent thousands of dollars to renovate Christina's bathroom to make it more accessible for her, and purchased her a new wheelchair, which to them proved that she was planning for her future. During the trial, many people were upset with Rita's daughter Elizabeth's testimony, all because of the way that she spoke about her sister. Here are some of the comments that some people found questionable. Well, it's, it was so hard to get her to smile for a picture because she was not photogenic at all. And so I'm sure it's my husband um, probably behind the camera doing a stupid dance or trying to get her to smile um, just for that picture to be taken. But, I mean, mom's holding her so tight. She was mom's whole world. Oh, this is when we um, all went to the aquarium together. Um, and... She, her hair was, was always a hot mess because she had she didn't get the good Asian jeans like I did, but her hair was always so bad. But this is us at the aquarium, and we loved going to Disney with her because her, her being special needs, um, she was treated like a princess, and I took full advantage of all the line cuttings with her. Had you ever known your mother to leave Christina in the car? No. You've never seen that? No. Never heard of it? No, sir. Did you ever spend any time with your mom when she was doing meth? No, she didn't even drink alcohol. Ultimately, after all of the evidence was presented to the jury, they didn't believe that the car was actually on, or that Larry and Rita just forgot about Christina. So on September 1st, 2023, the jury only took two hours to find Larry and Rita guilty of murder. Leave the jury in the above caption on the 
charge of murder of Christina and Pangalani find the defendant guilty. Oh my God! Oh my God! We the jury in the above captioned case on the charge of great bodily injury of a child. We find the defendant guilty. Oh my God! We the jury in the above captioned case on the charge of criminal conspiracy find the defendant not guilty. And it's signed by the four persons. Yes. No, you don't need to call the name of the fourth person. We, the jury in the above captured case on the charge of murder of Christina and Pangalani, find the defendant guilty. We, the jury in the above captured case on the charge of great bodily injury on a child, find the defendant guilty. And honestly, I wish they would have taken six hours just so they could have felt how horrible waiting on someone for that long actually feels. The judge that presided over the case was Clifton Newman, who is actually very well liked and well known for being the judge during the Alex Murdoch trial. Before determining their sentences, he listened to family members of Larry and Rita, including someone pretty shocking and telling about Rita's actual mental state. While she was out on bond, get this. She found herself a new husband. Instead of grieving or, I don't know, acting like someone whose child died in one of the most painful ways possible, she falls in love and gets married. Rita even decided to make a statement for herself, but I think you can see why most people believe it did more harm than good. It's almost unbelievable. How could you all do such a thing? And you could do such a thing because you're hooked on drugs. Hooked on meth. Pardon? I Yeah, well, that makes you having less an, ex an excuse, less justification. Your mind wasn't screwed up, as you're telling us now. <laughs> yeah, a mother who's not under the influence would leave their child in a car under those circumstances for five, six hours, who, would, who knew the child was in the car, and knew the child had been in the car for that period of time, and drive off and leave the child. How could you? Regardless, Judge Newman ended up sentencing Larry to 32 years for murder and an additional 20 years for great bodily harm for a total of 52 years. He sentenced Rita to 37 years for murder and an additional 20 years for great bodily harm for a total of 57 years. So I'm curious to know what you guys think about this case because it has been one where there are a lot of different opinions. To me, I think it highlights how drugs can completely change a person and ruin lives other than just the user. At one point, Rita was an amazing teacher, a good, loving, and attentive mother, and a vibrant woman. Some people believe that the pressure and stress of being a teacher and a single parent of a special needs child took a huge toll on her and that she turned to partying and substances to try to find some happiness. Rita's ex-husband, Wally, actually ended up being arrested for nearly $150,000 of back child support, which many people think shows how Rita was truly providing everything for her children on her own. Now, it's obviously not an excuse at all, and he should have definitely been paying child support and been involved with Christina, but I was curious why Rita still seemed to struggle so much with money. The area she lived in South Carolina is known for having a relatively low cost of living, and online it says that by retirement, most teachers with tenure would have been earning around $70,000 a year. Then she would get her retirement money, and she was working part-time teaching early childhood education and cleaning houses and getting money from her tenants. It just had me wondering where all of her money was going because, again, when it came down to it, she was able to post bond. 
it's possible that it was all going toward her partying habit. I mentioned before that some people think that Rita was envious of other adults her age at the bars, including Larry, whose kids were out of the house and who basically had no real responsibilities. In my opinion, I don't really think that Rita or Larry necessarily planned to kill Christina. I think it's more likely that their drug use became their only priority and fixation to the point where they really didn't care about anything else. I also did some reading to try to figure out if there was any possible way they could have turned the car on, and a few forms say that some cars will start to blow hot air after sitting idle for a certain amount of time. Others said that push-to-start vehicles have a feature where the car will turn itself off after sitting idle for 10 to 20 minutes in order to prevent the battery from dying. I couldn't find out whether or not Jettas have this feature, but if it does, Maybe Rita did turn it on, and it turned itself off. Maybe the battery even died after sitting idle for several hours. Which actually, no, I guess it couldn't if the lights were flashing when they were locking it over and over. Regardless, there is no excuse for leaving a child in a car for six hours, whether or not it is on. It does not matter. So do you think that Rita and Larry intended for this to happen? Was it a result of the drugs, or was it just an accident? There has actually been a lawsuit filed in Christina's name against the Department of Children and Family Services for not following up on reports made against Rita for neglect. It's something we talk about so often in cases like this. There were signs. People did report it. But somehow sweet Christina fell through the cracks anyway. In one other shocking piece of information, not long after her mother was arrested for Christina's death, Rita's oldest daughter Ashley was arrested for leaving her children in the car alone while she went into the grocery store. Obviously, it's a practice not uncommon in this family, and even her sister's death wasn't enough to open Ashley's eyes, and then she did this. In a recent interview, Ashley says that she's learned her lesson and wants to raise awareness about hot car deaths. Okay, you'd think that you would have known that after your sister's death, but okay. The police were called to you when your kids were in the car for a few minutes and you were charged with some kind of minor offense. Is it something normal? Is, 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 was there a belief that it would be okay to leave kids in the car with the air conditioning? Uh, where did this come from? Because you have to understand that, and I know you do, that Christina died. So was there something passed down that this is normal? Is this normal practice where you are? Is this normal? Was it normal practice in your family? It's definitely not a normal practice, but um, I think that she just didn't think my sister was in harm, like being harmed. I, she believed the AC was on. Um, as far as me, um, my daughter was verbal and she was old enough to ask me if she could sit in the car while I went and paid a bill. When the AC was on, she had drank and food um, when I had done it. and. I was gone maybe 10 to 12 minutes when I, you know, went and paid a bill and came right back. So, yeah. But so what would you say then to people? What would you say then to people? Not to do this, not to leave your kids in the car. Is there a lesson to be learned here? Could Christina's death teach everyone a lesson about children in hot cars? Absolutely, yes, yes ma'am. Like, now I never even leave mine in the car for a minute, you know. Um, if I go into the gas station to get a drink, they're coming right in with me, no matter how old they are or what the temperature is outside, whether my AC is running or not. Like, my kids are never left alone for not even a single second. Um, it made me definitely more aware and alert of that. And maybe by so. you talking about it, it'll make other people more aware of that. Uh, that Christina at least didn't die in vain. She died uh, with an education for all of you not to leave your kids in a car. Like I said earlier, this case is so much different than what we typically see in situations like this. This wasn't a mistake made by a busy parent or a tragic oversight. It was a choice that Rita and Larry made that resulted in the catastrophic death of a helpless little girl. Do you think that the sentence was too hard or too lenient? One of Rita's daughters stated that punishing her mother wouldn't bring Christina back, and while that's true, Rita and Larry need to be held accountable for ending the valuable life of a precious child far too soon. Oh. Oh. Lots of smiles. Hey. You like it? I usually love the movement. Yeah. I have quite a few. Yeah. Children that are a little bit... 
autistic or different and I love it. Love Wave. It. Hi, Christina. You doing good. It is a horrific case, guys. I know it wasn't easy to hear, and I appreciate you sticking with me. I'm really eager to know your thoughts, so please let me know in the comment section below. Before heading out, please don't forget to take a quick second, hit the subscribe button. It is absolutely totally free. It'll just make sure that next time you log into YouTube, you see any new videos that I've posted on other true crime cases. All right, guys, thanks again, and until the next case, stay safe. Bye.